This is Chapter 3, Describing, Exploring, and Comparing Data. Section 3.1 is Measures of Center. Measures of Center is a value at the center or the middle of the data set. The first measure of center that we have is mean, and this is a measure of center found by adding up all the observations that you have and dividing by the number of observations in that set. We have two formulas for population mean and another one for sample mean. They're calculated identically, um, except for with the population mean, we'll be using a population, and for a sample mean, you'll be using a sample. Mu is the variable that we'll be using to denote population mean, and this is computed by taking all the individuals in a population. And the population mean is a parameter, and to get this, we're going to add up all of these values and then divide by n, which would be the population size. Whereas the sample mean is identical to this, except for we're going to be adding up everything in the sample and dividing by n, which is our sample size. Also for our sample mean, we're going to call that variable x bar, and it is also a statistic. The symbol sigma is a Greek letter, and it tells us to add all the terms together, just in case we haven't seen this in a previous class. We also have resistant, which is a statistic, is resistant if the presence of an extreme value or an outlier does not cause it to change very much. And important properties about the mean, just one extreme value can change the value of the mean drastically. So the first example that we have here says the data below represents miles traveled to work by 10 employees at a local ice cream shop. And those miles are listed here. Compute the population mean. So in order to do this, we need to add up all these values. And so we're going to have to add up. And again, this says population mean, and the symbol that we're going to be using is mu. And we're going to have to add up 23 plus 12 plus 15 plus 8 plus 20 plus 11 plus 12 plus 5 plus 18 and plus 10. And then again, it tells us up here that there are 10 employees. You can also count those values. Dividing by 10, we arrive at 13.4. The units that are going to go with this are going to be miles. So the population mean miles driven to work at this ice cream shop are going to be 13.4 miles. Part B says find a simple random sample of size n equals 4 employees. Assume randomly we select these four values, 8, 12, 18, and 5. Part C says to compute the sample mean, which is x bar, which we get by adding up 8, 12, 18, and 5. And since there's only four values here, we'll divide by four. Calculating this sample mean, we get 10.75. And again, we're still talking about miles driven to work, so miles. Part D says a histogram is created below. What is the population mean and where is it? So again, our population mean is 13.4. And if you notice, 13.4 is pretty close to the middle of our histogram. Also, you will notice that the frequencies aren't listed over here, so we're actually going to have to go backwards from looking at the histogram to get those or using that list of values. So if you notice that first range, that values that we have is between 0 and 5, there's only 1, 2 between 6 and 10, 4 between 11 and 15, 2 in the next class, and then 1 in the next. And if you notice, too, this is bell-shaped. The next definition that we have is the median, which is denoted capital M, is a variable of the measure of center, so it's another measure of center. That is the value that lies in the middle of the data when the data is arranged in order. So steps to calculate this by hand is to arrange your data in order, either from smallest to largest or largest to smallest. And determining the number of observations, step three is going to be find the one in the middle. And then if two numbers are in the middle, then we calculate the mean of those values by adding them and dividing by 2. The next example that we have says from the previous example, find the median of the miles traveled to work. So again, here is the list of values that we have, 
and we're going to have to put these values in order. Again, you can either do that from smallest to largest or from largest to smallest. So I'm going to arrange them from smallest to largest. So 5, 8, 10, 11. We have two 12s. Make sure to list them both. 15, 18, 20, and 23. So looking at the middle, you'll notice that we actually have two values that lie in the middle, 12 and 12. So in order to calculate our median, which we also just call capital M, you add these two values together and divide by two, which works out to being 12. And again, we will put miles since those are our units. This is going to be the start of us using our calculator. You have a few options in regards to your calculator. You can either use a TI-83 or 84 graphing calculator. Casio also makes a graphing calculator. I am not as helpful in using that one, but you can definitely find helpful videos on YouTube. Um, and then another option is using graphing calc or other apps that are available to purchase or are free in the App Store. And if you have any questions about those, please talk to me about them or look in your syllabus also so for some more information. So you will notice these throughout the notes. It's going to be a smaller box that will say steps for finding whatever it is with a graphing calculator. And it's usually going to say a TI-83 and 84 graphing calculator. So the next thing is you'll notice that some of these are going to have boxes around them like we do for stats here. And that just means that it's going to be a button on the calculator. The graph and calc app is very similar to the graphing calculator steps. So if you are using that app um, on your own and at home, then make sure that you understand how that works as compared to the graphing calculator, but they do work very similar. So for this, find the stats button on your calculator. Scroll over to edit. Number one should say edit, hit enter. And put the data into L1. And then you're going to select stat again, which is again another button on your calculator. Go to calc. You're going to scroll over to the right. The first thing should be highlighted. It should say one var stats. Press enter twice. And you'll notice you get a lot of information given to you. And we'll be talking about most of that momentarily. But the first one that we've talked about so far is x bar, which is going to be the mean and MED, which is our median. Now, your graphing calculator doesn't know if it's a population or if it's a sample. That's something you need to determine, but the notation that it uses for both population and samples on the graphing calculator will be X bar. The next example says, using a graphing calculator, find the mean and the median of the exam scores of the 15 students in an algebra course. So again, not doing this by hand. In order to do this, we need to go to our graphing calculator and input all of these values into L1. On your calculator, you're going to select your stats button, hit enter on edit, and enter in all your numbers into L1. You are able to enter these numbers in by typing the number and selecting enter. Um, once you have all the numbers selected and entered in, you need to make sure that you double check to make sure those numbers are entered in correctly. Next, hit stat. Scroll right to calc using your right arrow button. Hit enter on one of our stats. And if you have a newer style, 84, it's going to ask for the list and the frequency list. And you want to leave that frequency list blank. If you have the older style calculator, you should just be press pressing enter twice. Once you have that, select enter and you'll notice you get quite a bit of information. The two things that we need for this problem are the mean, x bar, which rounds to 79.07 if we round two decimal places. And if you scroll down using your arrows, you'll see the median, which is equal to 80. From the graphing calculator, we got x bar. And since we are talking about a sample here, we'll write x bar is 79.07. And our median, which we'll just put as m or med, is 80. 
Some important properties about the median. An extreme value does not change the median by a lot. A large value is changed and the median will stay the same. The next example represents that. So this one says the data below represents the length and minutes of Jason's cell phone calls for the day. Find the mean and the median of the data and determine which measure of central tendency you think better describes the typical call lengths. So the lengths are here. We also have a graph here, which if you remember is a dot plot and it says the mean for the data is X bar minutes and the median for the data M is blank minutes. So in order to calculate this, we need to put all these values here into our L1 on our calculator. On your calculator, you're going to go to stats, select enter on edit, and you'll notice you have numbers in there from the previous problem that we did. To clear these numbers, we need to go up and highlight L1, and you have a clear button that's right above the caret or arrow up button, and you can select clear and then scroll down with your down arrow, and those numbers should be gone. And for L1, I'm going to enter in the new numbers that we have for this problem, which are 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 5, 4, 7, 5, and 52. So from here, I'm going to go to Stat, scroll right to Calc, select Enter, and enter again. Again, the frequency list will be left blank. And on this problem, we need our mean, which is X bar, which is 8.3, and our median, which is 3.5. From the graphing calculator, we get 8.3 minutes is our mean, and the median is going to be 3.5. The median better demonstrates the typical call length. And the reason why is because you'll notice that most of Jason's phone calls are between one minute and 10 minutes. And the one phone call out here that is at 52 minutes is an extreme value for his typical phone calls. So it says the 52 minute phone call is an extreme observation and causes the mean to increase substantially and has no effect on the median. So the median here would actually be a better uh, measure of sen sensor to use for this problem. And again, it's because of that extreme value or outlier that we have. And so for example, it says if that 52 minute phone call was eight minutes, then you'll notice that your mean is gonna be 3.9 and the median is 3.5. So the mean changed, but the median did not. So if that eight, that 52 minute phone call was moved to an eight minute phone call, which is pretty normal compared to his other phone calls, it wouldn't change that median. Versus it says if that 52 minute phone call was 152 minutes instead, even more extreme, you'll notice that that median does not change, it's still 3.5, but the mean drastically changes to 18.3. So the median stayed the same. Uh, most of the time, whenever you have these extreme values or these outliers, the median's gonna be a better measure of center to use. The last measure of center that we have um, isn't used as often, but we do use this, is our mode. This is the most frequent observation of data. It can be either quantitative data or qualitative data, data that we're given. So no mode means that no value is repeated. And so for this, an example would be given 1, 7, 3, and 16. If you notice, those values don't repeat. They're all just showing up once. And likewise, we can have multiple modes, which is where multiple data values repeat the same number of times. So an example of this would be something like 2, 4, 4, 7, and 2. And if you notice, 2 appears twice and so does 4. So both 2 and 4 would be modes. Important properties about modes, you can find the mode of qualitative data. And so 
with means and with medians, we weren't able to do that with qualitative data. So the next example says find the mode of the data above in regards to miles driven to work. So those miles driven to work are listed. If you take another look at that, you will notice that 12 is actually the mode. And the reason why is because it is occurring twice. So it occurs twice, which is the most that any of those numbers occur. And the next example, so that was a numerical example. Then we get into our qualitative example. This one says, the table below lists the colors of cars driven to college by 12 students and says, determine the mode of the color of car. And so we have a list of colors here. And so looking at these, you'll notice that black occurs three times and white also occurs three. So black and white are both the modes. And the reason why is because they occur the most and it occurs three times each. And again, that's the most. The next definition that we have is the mid-range. And this is a data set is the measure of center. That is the value midway between the maximum and minimum values of the original data set. So in order to find the mid-range, we're going to take our max data value and add it with our minimum data value and then divide it by two. Important properties about the mid-range, it's very sensitive to extreme values since you're using the maximum and minimum values. The next example is that for mid-range, and it says find the mid-range of the Verizon data speeds, and there's some listed there, and they are all in megabits per second. And so in order to calculate the mid-range, we have to have the max data value, which is your largest one, which is 55.6, and we add in our minimum data value, which the smallest data value that we're listed here is 14.1, and then divide by 2, which is 34.85 megabits per second. There is some information to read through with rounding rules for you. Most of the time, these rounding rules will be told to you like on an exam or on my open mouth, and so you need to make sure that you carefully read those and follow those rules that are given. Grouped data, so again, grouped data that we saw before is when data is summarized in a frequency distribution, we cannot find exact values of the mean or the standard deviation, which is going to be discussed next, um, exactly. However, we can approximate these measures. So uh, approximating the mean of a variable from a frequency distribution, and this is when we have grouped data, and again, we don't know those exact values, we just know that it might be a range of values that we are given. And so we have the population mean and the sample mean, which again, they're both calculated very similarly, multiplying the x value times f, where x is the midpoint of the value of the class, and f is going to be the frequency of that class, and then dividing by the sum of all those frequencies. And so next, right below that, we have the steps here for how to find the mean and the standard deviation for frequency distribution with an 83 or 84 calculator. There is an older style 83 and an older style 84 calculator and then there's a newer style 84 calculator also. So they all look a little different. So definitely make sure you understand how your calculator works. So the first thing is we're going to go to stat, edit, enter in, and we're going to enter in L1 which is going to be our class midpoints or exact value if no range is given. And then L2, which is going to be our frequencies or relative frequencies. Next thing we're going to do is hit stat button again on our calculator. Go over to calc, go to one var stats and hit enter. Now, if you have an older style calculator, it is going to write on the home screen, 
you will notice this part being there. And then the next thing that you're going to have to do is this step up here, which is you need to hit second, which is a button on your calculator, one, comma, second, two, and that's going to input the L1 and L2. This tells your calculator to look at list one and list two. And when you select enter from that, you're going to get a few different things here. Um, SX is going to be the sample standard deviation, which again we'll discuss in just a minute. X bar, which is going to be our sample mean, and again it would also be, this is an approximation, so it's always going to be an approximated sample mean. Sigma X, and this is going to be a population standard deviation. If you have a newer style 84 graphing calculator, when you go to stat calc and then go to one bar stats, this step here, if you have a newer style one, it might ask you to input the list, the frequency list, and then it would say calculate. And so for the list, that's where you would put your midpoints, that's going to be L1, which you get by hitting second one to input that there. Frequency list would be an L2, so second two to get L2 to show up. And then go down to calculate and hit enter. And the same information would be given to you. So we're going to try this on the next example, again, following along with the way that your calculator will do this. So this example says the following data represents SAT mathematics scores for 2010. Find the approximate mean of the data. So again, that approximate mean of the data. It's also for everyone in 2010. So we are technically, this is a population for 2010. And so if you notice, we have this range of values here from our group data, and we know that 36,305 students scored between 200 and 299. And so we don't know exactly how many students scored exactly 200 or exactly 212 or 240. We just know that there's 36,305 that scored between 200 and 299, and this is why we cannot exactly calculate that mean. That's why it's an approximate calculation. And so in order to do this, since we have group data, we need to have our midpoints. And so midpoints, again, are by adding together your lower and upper bounds and dividing by two. So 200 plus 299 and dividing by two, it's going to be 249.5, the next one will be 349.5, 449.5, 449.5, 649.5, and 749.5. And since we're calculating the mean, we need to put these midpoints into a 1. And our frequency, which is also called number, they don't always use the word frequency there, into L2. On your calculator, you're going to select Stat, enter on Edit, and enter in your midpoints into L1, and the number or the frequency into L2, and check to make sure that those values are correctly entered before you go on. Once you have those numbers entered, you're going to hit STAT again. Scroll right using your right arrow to CALC. Select ENTER on one var STATS. And this time if you have the newer style calculator, you will have to put in a frequency list. And that frequency list that we had is in L2. So to get L2, you need to hit SECOND and 2, and L2 should appear there. If you have an older style calculator, that is the way that the notes are typed. And so you need to hit second one comma second L2 after you've selected enter on the one var stats. From here, select enter and we get a mean. Again, the calculator only uses that X bar. It does not write mu, but this is population data. Our population mean is 519.74, 519.74.
for this problem. So again, from our calculator, we look at x bar, but since this is a population, I'm going to write it as mu. And I'll just put that x bar in parentheses to remind you that that's what we looked at on our calculator. And we get 519.74, which is the approximate mean The next thing we have here is the weighted mean. This is denoted x bar is an average in which each quantity can be averaged is assigned different weights. W, these weight, weightings determine the relative importance of each quantity on an average. In other words, a mean where some values contribute more than others. So the most common place we see this is with grades. If you take a three unit class, it's not weighted as much as a five unit class. And so we have to take that into consideration that there's different units or weights to each of these courses. So if you notice X bar here is W times X, and we are gonna add up all of those. W is gonna be the weight of the ith observation and X is the value of that ith observation and then dividing by the sum of all the W values, that was weights. So the example right below this says, Jason just finished the fall semester and he earned an A in four units trig class, a B in a three unit business class, a C in his three unit English class, a B in his five unit bio class. Determine Jason's grade point average. We first assign point values to each grade. So this is how grade point averages are calculate, calculated. An A is equal to four points, B is equal to three, C is two, and a D is equal to one. F is not worth anything. So in order to calculate our GPA, we need to put the weight of each of those, so those units, times the value of them. And so we have a four unit trig class times the grade that he got in that was an A, so that's worth four points. Plus the next class is a three unit business class, which he got a B, which is worth three points. The next class is a three unit English class, and he received a C in that, so that's worth two points. Plus the next one is a five unit course, and he received a B in that, which is worth three. Next, we divide by the total of all those weights or those units for this problem. So four plus three plus three plus five. Working this out, we get 46 divided by 15, which is 3.067. So that is his GPA. The next section that we have is 3.2, which is measures of variation. Measures of variation are used to quantify the spread of data. Numerical measures for describing the dispersion or spread of data in this section are going to be range, standard deviation, and variance. The main focus will be standard deviation. First definition that we have is a range, which is denoted R of a variable is the difference between the largest data value and the smallest data value. And that's written out here. Range is R, largest data value minus the smallest data value. Important properties of the range, it's very sensitive to extreme value since we are using the largest data value and the smallest data value. The example right below this says, from the miles traveled to work, and they're listed there, compute the range. So looking at this, we need to have our largest and our smallest data value. So the largest one would be 23, and the smallest will be five. So the range will be the largest minus the smallest, which is 18 miles. The next definition that we have here is standard deviation. Standard deviation is a statistic that tells you how close all the various data points are clustered around the mean. If the data points of a set vary greatly from the mean, they're more dispersed, then the standard deviation will be large. And you can see down here, dispersed data set. And then likewise, if the data points of a set are varied only slightly from the mean, then the standard deviation will be small. 
and so these are going to be clustered together. And again, you can see the standard deviation will be that spread of those values. So next we have our population standard deviation and our sample standard deviation. So the population standard deviation, the variable that we will be using is sigma. And this is a lowercase Greek letter, pronounced sigma. And it is the measure of how much data values deviate away from the population mean. Likewise, the sample standard deviation, which is denoted S, is the measure of how much data values deviate away from the sample mean. We have two different formulas to calculate the standard deviation of a sample. The formulas are similar for a population, except for dividing by capital N instead of N minus 1. We will not be calculating standard deviation by hand. Instead, we'll be computing it using our graphing calculator. So an important property about the standard deviation, it's not negative. Larger values indicate greater variation, and units will be the same as the original data. The next example says the following frequency distribution represents the number of live births in thousands in the U.S. in 2008 by age of the mother determine the population mean and standard deviation of the data. So we have the age of mother in years and births in thousands. And since this is grouped data, we don't know exactly the values of the mom between the ages of 10 and 14. We just know that there was 6,000 live births. So this would be an approximation to these values. But since this is for all of 2008, this is a population. So in order to do this problem, we do need our midpoints, since this is group data. And so the first midpoint we would get by adding 10 and 14 and dividing by 2, which is 12. The next one, 15 plus 19 divided by 2 is 17. And then 22, 27, 32, 37, and 42. And these midpoints will have to go into L1. And these births, which are listed in thousands, you do not need to put all those three zeros after the numbers. You just write them as 6, 435, 1053, and so forth, are the frequencies. And they are going to have to go into L2. On your calculator, you're going to go to Stats, select Enter on Edit, and enter in your midpoints into L1 and your births or frequencies into L2. We are dealing with population data, so keep that in mind. Next, we go to Stat, scroll right to Calc, select Enter on one of our stats. And again, since we have a frequency list, we need to enter in L2 there by hitting second, two, Again, if you have the older style calculators, which is going to be a TI-83 in the previous 84s, you need to hit enter on the one var stats and then do second, one, comma, second, two to have it telling the calculator to look at L1 and L2. From here, select enter. And we get a lot of information. For this problem, it was asking for the mean age. That would round to 27.37 years. And then since we are dealing with a population, you need to make sure you look at sigma x for that standard deviation, which rounds to 6.28 years. From our graphing calculator, we get that our mean is going to be 27.37. And this is years old. So we'll just put years. And our standard deviation is going to be 6.28 years. So the average age of a mother, this is in 2008, would be 27.37 years. The next thing listed here is the range rule of thumb. And you will see this range rule of thumb wording throughout 
the course. And so, and you'll also notice the same graph being given. So values that are not significant are gonna be within two standard deviations of our mean. I'm gonna go ahead and use a mu for a population. This also could be worded exactly the same with X bar and using sample. Going two standard deviations to the right and two standard deviations to the left, you'll notice that going two standard deviations to the left, we're gonna subtract away two sigma from our mean. And those values that are smaller than this are significantly low values. Likewise, adding two standard deviations to our mean are gonna be significantly high values. It is also worded here for you. Significantly low values are mu minus two sigma or lower. Significantly high values are gonna be mu plus two sigma or higher. And values that are not significant will be between those two. The next definition that we have is variance. Variance of a set of value is the measure of variation equal to the square of the standard deviation. The population variance is sigma squared and the sample variance is s squared. And so the population variance is just taking that standard deviation that we get from our calculator and squaring it. Likewise with the sample variance. Important properties of the variance. Units are square units of the original data. The next thing that we have is the empirical rule. And the empirical rule says if a distribution is roughly bell-shaped, then approximately 68% of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. And it's listed here in words, and then it's also shown down here, and you'll see the 68% between one standard deviation from the mean. And then it also says approximately 95% of the data will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. So plus or minus two sigma or two S. And then the third one says approximately 99.7 of the data will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Again, you can see this and that's within three standard deviations of the mean. And this would be likewise also for um, a sample data, and the only difference would be obviously you're gonna be using X bar instead of mu, and S would replace sigma.